Okay, thank you all for having the patience to be here still at the last panel. Um, but we promise you, it will be good. This is a panel um, that focuses on continuing injustices today that come out of a colonial past. And for that, um, we invited two speakers that have two things in common. One, they both work and live in countries um, that were former British colonies. And second, they use litigation uh, to fight against economic and social injustices and environmental degradation. So what we will talk about is how this litigation, how they do it, um, and how it deals with the economic injustices that are still in these countries today, in India and in Nigeria. So on my left is Kranti. Um, he's a lawyer and litigates human rights issues at various forums. He's also the executive director of the Human Rights Law Network. Um, ECCHR has had the pleasure to work with uh, the Human Rights Law Network during the past year, so some of the litigation that we've been doing together might also come up. Um, but they litigate actually so many issues that it's uh, hard to keep up with that goes from prisoners' rights to um, tribal rights, uh, environmental degradation, and many other issues. On my right is Chima. Uh, Chima works um, with the Environmental Rights Action, and he also has his own uh, law office. And he has been engaged uh, in litigation in, in the Niger Delta, um, which has brought groundbreaking litigation in the Netherlands um, and also within uh, Nigeria itself. So we'll also hear about that. Um, <clears throat> so this panel takes up a few of the issues that have been mentioned already today, um, but also really yesterday. Um, for example, the question of economic sovereignty. Um, that was brought up uh, by Celine Tan. Um, and we will do what um, Mr. Um, Macau was uh, referring to as we should also talk about money. Um, so that's what we will do. Um, we will basically do it in three parts. Uh, and at the very end, there will be uh, space for questions. So please feel free to engage uh, and think about the questions you would like to ask to the speakers. The first part, uh, we will speak about economic exploitation, uh, both during the colonial era and afterwards, and sort of the continuation uh, or the differences between these two eras. Secondly, we'll speak about the place of the corporation within international law and what that means uh, for the possibilities and impossibilities in litigation and how and why economic injustices uh, continue uh, until today. And thirdly, we will look at legal intervention by NGOs, uh, and we'll discuss also a little bit about the species of NGOs um, as an actor, a relatively new actor actually on the international stage, and their role in pushing for human rights norms, particularly in this uh, area of economic and social rights. So what I would like to start with um, is a question I'll start on my right. It will be a dialogue going back and forth between the speakers. Um, Chima. Yeah. Economic exploitation during the colonial era and afterwards, what did it look like? Um, what were the disjunctures? Um, and what are the major issues that you see in your country as economic and social injustices that you work on? Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, first, I must uh, thank um, the Academy of Arts and uh, the ECCHR for making it possible uh, for us to be here to share this space and share our experiences and learn from each other, you know, what we're doing and to better um, appreciate what we are doing and how to do it better. Uh, because uh, the collective experiences that we've shared since yesterday will only help in reshaping our vision, our focus, and our pattern of continuing this struggle um, perhaps before I answer the question, uh, I would like to um, say a little bit about what was said yesterday, you know, in terms of uh, for us not to get so disencouraged, you know, that yes, there is no headway, there is nothing we can do, okay, uh, because majority of the people um, who are in the panels are lawyers and we are only speaking in terms of you know, law can, alone cannot do anything. But I want us to ponder on this. 
if all of us are doing the little that we are doing, and we still have the world be the way it is, let us, for once, stop, ponder, and imagine if we were not doing anything at all, how the world would have looked like. So in that, we can encourage ourselves that we are doing something that we need to upgrade, you know, maybe the things that we are doing so that we can achieve better results. Thank you very much on that. Now, coming back to my country and, you know, how it used to be colonial exploitation and what is present. I, I, I think for those of you that followed the history of Nigeria, would, I mean, this question will be like a, a ton because can we actually say that there is a positive difference between what it used to be in the colonial era and what it is post, you know, colonial era period. And when we talk about colonial era, will be when we were under the British control. And post-colonial, we'll be talking about when we got flag independence and when we became a republican country and now that we are a pseudo-democracy. Okay, so what has changed? For me, following a little bit of history, first is that how did Nigeria come about as a country? And this is the problem of most African countries because the emergence of the nation states in Africa to a large extent were not indigenously driven. They were externally, you know, created. Nigeria became Nigeria after the 1914 amalgamation of the southern and, you know, northern protectorates, which were British business empires. So colonialism came through trade, economy, you know, the outer world needed new vistas of opportunities to extract resources, both human and natural, to be able to sustain the good lives, you know, of the um, emerged countries, which is now the developed countries, the classification of developed, developing, and underdeveloped countries. So these are creations of a hegemony, as we had yesterday. Now, how has it been? Nigeria became amalgamated, became a sovereign Nigerian country in 1914 through the um, activities of Lord Lugard, who was the then colonial governor sent from um, England by the Queen to oversee Nigeria. And the division of the country into two was to know the quantum of resources that would be extracted from each of these you know, protectorates. The southern protectorate had enormous resources then. The northern protectorate had mass land mass. Okay, so you have to balance what you extract. Of course, majority of the funds that was used to administer Nigeria then came from the south. But you needed where you can deploy other developmental, other activities. And that was a not. So that was how, first and foremost, the fusion of unwilling partners came about. Because when Nigeria was made, the North said, no, we want to stay on our own. And the South said, no, we want to stay on our own. But we were all forced together. Now, from here, all the economic policies that ensued were all developed from London and pushed down to the different you know, colonies 
including the Nigerian uh, colony. Now, how did this impact on the people? Of course, students of history will know that there were some resistance in Nigeria about the economic policies that were introduced at some time. And that is how we got to have the about women riot of 1921, okay, which came as a result of imposition of tax payments on women, which was alien to the populace. So from there, the issue of resource, because before the advent of oil, which is the main uh, cross of my talk here, there were other, you know, Nigeria was mostly an agrarian community sustained by agricultural products, like the granite pyramid in the north and the palm oil business in the south. So, and these were dictated, the prices were fixed, cocoa um, in the southwest, the prices were fixed from London. The indigenous people of Nigeria, where these products were coming from, did not have a say as to who gets what, when, and how, and what should be placed as a price tag on those items. So this situation continued until in the 50s when oil was discovered. Um, oil was discovered first in commercial quantity in Oloibri, in present-day Bayelsa State, in 1956. But before then, oil was already discovered in Nigeria. So, but maybe not in viable commercial quantity. And with the advent of oil, you know, came its own economic problems. Because the price of crude was fixed from London, and the present joint venture arrangement that Nigerians are still crying over was designed by the British colonial masters. And that has not changed. It is still operational to date. The terms and conditions are still what is operational. And that is why perhaps today, no, not many Nigerians have the opportunity of seeing the joint venture arrangement that Nigeria as a nation has with the oil companies. Okay, I think I can stop here and look up to the other question. But please, um, the way I discuss in panels, I like to carry everybody along, and I like you to carry me along. So for me, feel free, don't, um, I've told moderator, he, she can make this panel very lively because this is the last panel, okay? <laughs> and you know, our panel is supposed to aggregate everything that has been done here. And everybody that had not had the opportunity of asking questions or making comments, we see this panel as the last opportunity to do that. So even as we are talking, feel free to stop us and ask questions. Thank you very much. So before we turn to India, I actually do have a follow-up question. Because if I'm not mistaken, in 1960, Nigeria became independent. Before that, the joint venture between um, Shell and the government uh, was all decided in Britain. Why did that not change with the political independence? Well, why did that not change? Because what controls politics? Economy controls the politics of the day. How strong your economy is determines how strong you are politically. And the, the, the route to independence, we all knew how it got. It, it wasn't a struggle, an armed struggle independence that Nigeria got. It was a negotiated independence. So probably it was possible that at those conferences that took place to discuss the flag independence, part of the conditions were that, look, we'll leave certain things the way they are. So I think 
That is how the arrangement remains. Don't forget, it's Royal Dutch Shell. Thank you. So now we turn um, to India. And as you answer um, about sort of the economic exploitation during colonialism and continuing social economic injustices today, I have a question because when we had an early conversation between the three of us, uh, I remember that Chima said um, that he actually thinks or that he admires the way in which India really became an independent country. Um, so the question is, is it right to still blame colonialism for continuing social and economic injustices if it is the Indian government that creates um, special economic zones and invites foreign investment? Um, so I'm just going to take the liberty Chima gave, you know, about saying that you can just butt in and ask your questions. Uh, so I'm just going to veer a little away from what we're going to talk about. I just want to reflect a bit about uh, what was discussed over the last two days, especially because this is the last panel. Um, and the caveat is out there that I understand that a lot of us in the room come from different origins, different uh, backgrounds and educations. We may not be speaking the same language, so predominantly we may be using the same words. I'm sure they have meanings and context to them. But I'm just going to take, um, I'm going to take a risk there by uh, understanding what I understood about what was being said over the last two days. And I must say this, that every time we have put academics and lawyers in the same room, there's always a very curious um, tension right, about, about what one thinks of, of the other's work, especially the human rights lawyers and uh, the academicians who work on these issues. It's very, very curious. I've seen it year after year. Um, Europe is very lucky like that. You guys have uh, um, uh, the inclination and the resources to bring people from different disciplines together, and, and it's, it's a, a beautiful learning experience. It's also interesting to see how they see each other's worlds. Um, um, I just wanted to say this, uh, that about a lot of the lawyers that take up, uh, I'm not going to say human rights law. Yeah, I'm, going to say, I'm going to speak about it in, in terms of, of resistance law. Right? A lot of lawyers that represent communities in many parts of the world understand that the law is a tool of ex exploitation. It's a tool of oppression. Uh, it's designed in a particular manner, to work in a particular manner, and the legal system works extensively um, to keep status quo. You know, that's, that's the design of the system. Uh, the law dispenses with, uh, in, in many jurisdictions, the law completely provides for um, and also dispenses with the participation of marginalized communities who would suffer the law. Um, so the ask which comes that, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about getting more political, it, it, it sounds like uh, you know, you're, doing the, you're engaging with the system. Why don't you dispense with, with this process and get more political? I don't think it should be an or, really. I mean, they, they both, whoever is doing the law needs to do more, one. Um, and there's really no point in asking for the boycott of the law, really, because the law anyways boycotts the marginalized. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for, for, so I don't see that being a really real thing. The courtroom for many lawyers uh, and activists is a place where you amplify the voices of the marginalized uh, um, simply so that courtrooms get used to, which is a, a very, very elite construct, really. Uh, courtrooms get used to what, uh, what, what, what those who are being disenfranchised have to say about it. Uh, I remember uh, there is this uh, story, one of the Indian, um, Juris was quoted here yesterday. One of the things, other things also that happened during his time, he was defending some, some people who were part of the armed struggle. And uh, the question that was put to him by the judge was that, you know, uh, your clients don't believe in the Constitution, right? So why are they here arguing within the Constitution? And his response was, it's not my people on trial today. It's not my clients on trial today. It's your Constitution which is on trial today. And I think that's the underlying uh, ethos for a lot of us about, we, we completely understand how hollow the law is. We completely understand how difficult it is. Uh, but this is also a battle that has to be fought, along with many, many battles. Uh, for many narratives, uh, the law is but a sliver of, resist of the resistance process. Uh, unfortunately, in many narratives, uh, unfortunately, the way things work out many a times is that the 
the legal fight tends to take gallops way ahead of other resistances. But partly because it's such an elite exercise, it tends to get so much more ahead and get so much more attention, which is also in, 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 the, in how movements analyze it, or are also very critical of that. Uh, um, but I just wanted to flag that. Um, uh, and, and, and the reason why I said resistance law is I think to band, bandy all resistance together, you know, for people who may not even have heard about the international declarations and people whose lands are being taken away. To simply turn around and put all of them together as human rights, uh, putting it together, I think is a little tricky, so to speak, because, um, and, and there is enough literature, again, around these issues from people who have who worked, you know, uh, on the ground, uh, uh, on a lot of this resistance law, so to speak, and, and how, uh, who, who have extensively also criticized the whole imperialist agenda to human rights law per se, and, and how they yet justified as something that uh, emerges also, uh, how, the uh, how resistance emerges and, and uses from human rights literature, so to speak, and, and talks about, uh, and, and, and I don't know if, the resistance on the ground uses the language of human rights. Uh, there is the language of resistance. Uh, our analysis, um, or the languages that we use, and the way we analyze them, we tend to use the terminologies of human rights on and so forth. I'm not so sure if they sit comfortably within that construct. Uh, India is a complex place, um, and there is a very strong divide of civil society, uh, or what is understood as civil societies. Most NGOs get uh, labeled as civil society, and then you have the movements on the other end, which is the people's movements, the labor unions, so on and so forth. And uh, there's an uncomfortable, but uh, they, they sit on the same table at times, but I don't know if one would put the two together, right? Um, um, in certain contexts, maybe the movement will use the language of human rights, but I'm not so sure if, if our generalization of, of that uh, is, is, it should be a given at any point of time. Um, much has been said about India being a colony of the British and you know, how exploitative the whole process has been. Uh, I think one of the things that gets, um, you know, then we talk about how the British decided uh, for large tracts of the country about what should be grown and how cash crops were forced upon large sections of the rural population, um, or how it led to famines and so on and so forth. But I think that two or three aspects of colonization I think uh, we need to reflect on a little more. Uh, one is that uh, our forest laws, uh, where the British saw um, vast tracts of uh, timber, vast tracts of forests as timber, and put in legislation to effect, which basically um, took large chunks of indigenous people and treated them as aliens to their own homelands, right? And the assumption always was that if you connected the cities, all the lands and all the forests between them would also be part of, the, of this new nation state that they had come to govern. Um, so that uh, process of, of the Forest Act, which we uh, inherited from the British, uh, kept indigenous people, um, uh, it, I think it wiped out scores and scores of indigenous people and their populations across the length and breadth of the country at one end. Um, similarly, we had something called the Criminal Tribes Act, where all those that the British couldn't manage uh, basically uh, notified them as criminal tribes. So you were a cr you're criminal at birth. Uh, age of cognizance was four in the series of uh, amendments that were brought out to the law. So at the age of four, you could be arrested, and, 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 and it was unlike traditional criminal law, uh, where the state had to prove its case against you. you. The onus was on you to prove that the case against you was not, um, um, uh, you had to dis disprove the case. Um, that's again something that uh, trans persons were also, way back then, uh, I don't think the British understood how to manage people who didn't fit in manageable, manageable uh, definitions. So even trans persons were put into that. Um, so from that, uh, so I think those are those two things that I think you know, one should also look at when we're looking at colonization. Uh, because some of these uh, ideas that were instilled in us as part of, and even though we became a democracy, we took a lot of those prescriptions 
and we continued with them. So much so that uh, uh, the criminalization, say, of homosexuality uh, remained on our books till, till, till recently. Our, our courts have not made up their minds really, except I think now, maybe, most probably within this year, the court will turn around its view on. Uh, uh, similarly so with uh, indigenous people and their rights to their lands. It's something that we brought about through a legislative change only in 2008, between 2005 and 2008. Um, colonization also, so, so I think it's just because you become a democracy, uh, things don't change overnight. Uh, that's the, I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. Uh, colonization leaves in its wake uh, a life of aspiration for many people who then want to speak in the English language, who want to be like the Western world. It causes you to discard uh, various notions, some I'm glad we discard, uh, but the many that we acquire have their own problems and that creates its own uh, complex environments to work in. Uh, the reason I'm saying all of, all of this is, is, to, you know, is to go to your question, is that, oh, that happened 69 years ago. Uh, you know, colonization got over 69 years ago, so don't you want to start to stop blaming the, the erstwhile colonies, so to speak? Um, do I have a minute or two more? Um, two. Or it's going to two. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting uh, that colonization came to India on the shoulders of, of a corporation, right? Uh, one or two corporations, or three corporations the East India Company and the, the, the Dutch and all of them. And uh, what we now see in the country is again another round of corporations. I'm not so sure if this time the corporations will bring these nation states with them because I think the corporations have become far bigger than the nation states themselves. Um, so that would be an interesting thing to watch. But how, uh, in spite of where, where you could be a democracy, right? and yet it's actually economics which determines how much of a democracy you really are and, and how your laws get influenced by economic powers. and and. Uh, while uh, for approximately 45, 40 years after democracy, uh, when we decided to, be, uh, to have our people first, really, and not have capital first, and we designed our laws to ensure that um, we would try and give our people uh, education, health, uh, industry, uh, the larger global wisdom was of capitalization and globalization, which basically meant that the last 25 years have seen a very, very earnest attempt by our government to, to dismantle the law which, may, which considered its people first. And I'm not saying everything was very, very hunky-dory, uh, but what we've now seen is that at the behest, at the instance of multinationals, uh, through acting through the World Bank and the IMF, we have put into place an entire s set of reforms, so to speak, uh, which have taken away every protection that we thought was necessary for people's health, that was necessary for the environment, that was necessary for the working class, that was necessary for the construct of sovereignty itself. And uh, we will now have, we, we now face, I think we're the precip of a new colonization, and, and it would be good to see how to fight that out. Thank you. So we turn now more to this transnational corporation. Um, Already in 1979, um, well, please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 1979, um, Mohammed Bejawi uh, already said that the multinational company um, were actually uh, the chartered companies of modern times. Um, so we're going to look at this sort of species, uh, particularly of transnational companies. And um, before we turn sort of to the the specific examples. Um, I'd like to briefly go back to the time where there was still a discussion um, between international lawyers, um, but also between different representatives of states about what these transnational companies were actually. Um, because there was a time where it was still a question whether transnational companies should be viewed as private entities um, or if they should be viewed differently as um, sort of the kind of entity that they are actually in determining things that used to be uh, within 
the space of the sovereign. Um, and another question that comes up time and again, um, whether or not foreign entities would be allowed to own, um, to own land and, and property uh, within the country. Um, because these questions sort of faded away um, once there, um, there was the UN Commission on Transnational uh, Corporations, which was viewed back then actually as a victory that there would be a commission that would discuss about these transnational corporations. But within sort of the terms in which this commission was going to have the discussion, it was already settled that these companies were private entities, free to move around and free to own uh, property and land elsewhere, which then sort of set the groundwork for how these transnational corporations were, were allowed to operate. Um, and the debates in which, for example, Salvador Allende spoke out and said, you know, if we only speak about political sovereignty and forget about um, sort of that that's only the tip of the iceberg and there's, there's so much below it that is about these economic powers, we're not really talking about the real things. Um, and I think that's what we're still talking about today. And I think we should also ask whether the framing of business and human rights not actually also puts it as, as, as at the back foot um, as it sort of assumes that business as business is done is fine, they should just should um, sort of a little bit more uh, adhere to, to human rights. Um, with that background, um, I'd like to look at Shell um, and especially what you told me also about how Shell operated still during the colonial era within Nigeria and then afterwards and uh, their, their behavior and how it changed. Thank you very much. I, I think it's quite an interesting um, analysis you've made um, because for one is that do the developing countries have the powers to checkmate these multinationals, their activities and otherwise? Okay, now, as I said earlier, Economic power determines the political power you weigh. And if we have a scenario where most of the developing countries that are host to these multinationals, you know, are even intimidated by the multinationals, let alone their home countries, because most of these multinationals are they have some state holdings from their home countries. And we talk about Shell. Shell, um, Britain, UK has, you know, um, a major shareholding and Netherlands has a major holding. Okay, so, and this is why it is Royal Dutch. The royalty come from England and the Dutch come from Netherlands. And these are two economic powers, you know, that are interested in what these companies do. The, 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 the profits that they repatriate to the state. And that is one of their major concerns. So the attitude or its behavior in host countries or host states, you know, is for you to bother yourself about. Now, I will, I will say this, and I am happy that uh, Professor Lisbeth is here. We worked together on the uh, um, Dutch shell case from Nigeria. And I will tell you, we were very quite optimistic after our presentations that we're going to get a different kind of ruling. But between me and you, we know that political intrigues came to play, and governments of Netherlands and UK, you know, may have put their feet because that case would have opened up a vista of opportunity for the oppressed and intimidated peoples, you know, from developing countries where these multinationals harness the resources with which they empower their home countries, you know, where they are regarded as good corporate citizens you know, it will affect them. Now I am coming because I have to draw the analogy so that we'll understand the attitude and why the companies are behaving in one way or the other, okay? Because 
I say this without fear of contradiction, that Shell has become more monstrous in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta, today than it was, you know, uh, pre-independence and just shortly after independence. Because now, before independence, they were reporting to the colonial office in London, okay? And which meant that certain standards were still expected of them so that their behavior would be re regarded as, you know, doing well, okay? But now, under a sovereign state of Nigeria, what do they do? They have gone haywire because if you check incidents of corruption, much of the corruption that happens in you know, the oil sector in Nigeria is traceable to Shell. If you check violations, in terms of any type of violation you can think of, okay, Shell plays a major role. Shell bribes security forces. It's not, it's not news, okay? Shell bribes government officials. And in that, un under the colonial regime, it was difficult for them to do such things. But now, they can brazenly do it. It is the conduct of Shell because some persons led by Led Kansaro, who were of blessed memory, you know, wanted to pry open the activities of Shell. What happened to Ken? He was state murdered because, and who orchestrated that? Shell. There are a lot of crises that has happened in the recent past in the Niger Delta. You will see the finger prints of these companies, you know, try to create divide and rule among the community people. So in terms of performance, there is no gain saying, even within themselves, they know it, that they be, have become worse than they were. Of course, now they want to you know, appropriate as much as they can. It's, it's, it's the analogy you, 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 you presented, you know, on the right of companies to own properties in, 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 in the host states. Shell and the other oil companies will apply and be given expanse of land, you know, where they will put buried pipelines and it is a no-go area. And that will be forcefully acquired from the indigenous people that uses such places for their farming and fishing businesses. So without, you know, when you talk about adequate compensation, who determines what is adequate, you know, in compensation? Who? The person that is paying, whatever he or she pays, it thinks is adequate. But for the person that is in receipt, it can never be adequate because compensation that does not take into account you know, the future use and benefits of that place that thinks of the immediate cannot be said to be adequate. So if you look at it from that prism, we'll say conclusively that Shell by her conduct, of course the environmental despoilation that is happening, that you know, have brought us now as lawyers to start working with communities, you know, to do both national and transnational litigation, you know, if they were considerate and applied the standards that they apply in their home states, in their host states, I do not think we would have the opportunity of doing this, okay? But because of double standard application, then we must always continue to struggle, you know, to tell them that you are wrong.
So I'd like to <coughs> like to ask you to um, tell a bit more because you already mentioned your litigation in the Netherlands, um, but you've also done litigation in Nigeria. Sure. So what made you decide to actually bring a case to the Netherlands? Um, why was it not sufficient to actually litigate in Nigeria and get justice there? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this, this is a question that I've answered one and in the millions times. Okay, so now it is very simple. When you talk of getting justice, access to justice does not only start and end with getting a pronouncement. If that is the case, I wouldn't have bothered supporting any community to litigate transnational, okay? And because for me, as a lawyer, I believe in the Nigerian judicial system. It is one of the best you can see anywhere in the world. Of course, there is no um, setting that doesn't have the bad eggs but majority of the judges want to do what is right, based on the law. And I've been a beneficiary of that. Okay? Um, the first case that we did against the multinational, which everybody thought is undoable, is impossible, you can't even think of it. How can you drag Shell to court for flaring gas when Nigerian government cannot even try that, and they are supporting them? We did that. We went to court and we said, gas flaring violates the constitutional rights of citizens to life and dignity of the human person. And we justified it before the court. And the court agreed with us. That was in November 2005. And ordered Shell to stop gas flaring. But today is January 2018 gas flaring continues. Despite our efforts to commit the executive officers of Shell to prison for disobedience to court order. But now, you know, to show how the state and the multinationals work hand in glove to deprive citizens The judge that gave ruling against Shell continued flaring of gas was punished by being transferred from the Niger Delta, where the issue of oil and gas is happening, to then uh, the state of the then president in Katsina, which is over thousands of kilometers away from the Niger Delta, where there is no business of extraction happening. And later on, he was fixed and dismissed. But an application that was made to stop the execution of that court order when we started the committal proceedings at the Court of Appeal, where the sitting presiding judge declared the process to stop, okay? Because there was supposed to be an exhibition hearing for Shell to come and present before the lower court, you know, a scheme of plan to put out gas flaring within one year in compliance with the judgment of the court, for the court to grant that stay of um, execution order at the lower court, and Shell ran to Court of Appeal without argument because we filed an objection to the Court of Appeal hearing that. The Court of Appeal asked us, okay, we won't hear your objection, we won't hear Shell's application, let the status quo anthem remain. And we know what that means. The court became a party to the suit. Because you didn't hear any argument from either side, and then you are delivering a ruling. What is the basis? Now, this, the presiding judge was rewarded by being promoted from Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court of Nigeria. 
So you can see glaringly that the problem, the dilemma of citizens and those of us as lawyers who wants to use the instrument of the law is not about getting justice from the courts, from court pronouncements, but enforcing those court decisions. And this is the reason why you know, we want to come and meet Shell in their home states where they are regarded as good corporate citizens. Let's see if the court in The Hague decides that Shell should stop or do this, whether they will comply with it or not. So this is basically the only reason why we do transnational litigation. Thank you. We will get back. <clears throat> We'll get back to the case in the Netherlands in much more detail. Um, I'd like to turn briefly to, to India, because you do a lot of litigation, um, also against companies, transnational companies as well. And Indian judges haven't been shy to be progressive. Um, but is it sufficient? Is domestic legislation sufficient to take on this challenge, or do we need an international treaty? <laughs> Um, I think there is much to be said about how law treats capital itself, right, one. And, and, and that's why I think it's very important to, uh, why I think your former question needs to be dealt with a little more, you know, how much do you attribute to colonization? Um, because there is a history before colonization, there's a history after colonization, right? So if you were to appropriate uh, your misery, where do you, or do you then look at the construct of the law itself, which grants, which with the emergence of uh, transnationals, really what has happened is that capital now enjoys uh, a, a, a very high degree of anonymity. It enjoys a fantastic degree of immunity. You know, I think capital kind of enjoys the kind of immunity that heads of state don't enjoy, really, and, and a fantastic degree of flexibility. They can disappear. Um, we now in my country, in the last few months, the government allows you to set up a company in less than 24 hours, right? You could affect the lives of millions of people uh, by setting up, uh, you know, capital I think enjoys more power uh, than, it's a legal fiction really and it enjoys so much more power. So there is that. Um, courts celebrate that, right? Courts celebrate that um, and confer more and more uh, a confirmed astounding sense of immunity to capital. Time and again, you just have to go through the various judgments. The few times that courts have acted against corporations have been because there's been a prescription in the law, really. Like you were saying, Chima, you know, the law becomes more beautiful when, the, when a judicial officer sitting somewhere decides to give it some teeth. But that's, that's also because it's in the prescription of the law. Um, in the afternoon session, somebody mentioned that, you know, at least once a judge, I suppose, in Europe is allowed to look up the reasonable aspect and do something a little more outside the box, so to speak. So um, we've had, uh, so, I, so I, I, I don't think there's only a need to, I mean, there's, you, you underline the fact that yes, transnational corporations seem to be taking the law for a right, seem to be taking citizens' rights for a right, but the fact of the matter is that India has its own homegrown brand of transnational companies, and they don't seem to be any better uh, at all, right? Um, all that democracy, when, with, with independence, what happened was a transfer of power, and, and, and that's the same construct with whether it's transnationals or whether it's the homegrown transnationals um, who are doing a fantastic job of dismantling uh, the apparatus in place, one. Um, what the, the real difference is between the homegrown transnationals and the transnational from outside is that at least for the transnationals from outside, you can charge them, like what Chima was saying, with uh, double standards. That you, know, you have certain, let's say, laws on sexual harassment, uh, say in Europe, but for the same set of people when they are, let's say, in India, the standards um, are patently different on the pretext that you know, the domestic law requires us to have a different set of standards. Do you have some 
moral obligation to your people or to the environments that you work in that you would have some sort of, we talk about universal human rights, can you have a universal set of rights, a uh, set of laws that govern your conduct across jurisdictions? Um, as far as uh, coming back to, so this is the background where you know the law celebrates uh, capital and, and, and increasing power to capital on one end. Uh, courts have, uh, at some instances, some instances taken on corporations, uh, but inadequately so. Uh, time and again, I think the issue around the Bhopal tragedy is still undecided, uh, really, in terms of, we are, I don't know what, two, two and a half decades away from, uh, since when it happened. Um, the criminal trial continues. Um, they've not been brought to bo the book as yet. Uh, compensation still is lying in the treasury. It's not being doled out. Uh, um, on one end, uh, corporations after corporations have uh, polluted various uh, entire stretches of lands and rivers. Uh, cases have been initiated, N not necessarily. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember of many successful cases where we've come to fruition of any measure. Is the problem in the law or is the problem elsewhere? And you have been involved a little bit in negotiations about the UN treaty, which would um, provide an international treaty on business and human rights. Do you think that that is needed and how would that complement your current litigation within India? Um, as far as uh, litigating against corporations within India and outside, uh, the fact of the matter is that um, while you could launch litigation inside India against transnationals, we do not have enough, uh, enough cases, uh, case studies to say very, uh, say very clearly that this, this is, uh, uh, we'd like to celebrate domestic jurisprudence, yes. Uh, I don't think we have enough case studies to say that this is going to go well, uh, that we have a good uh, trajectory, so to speak of. One, two, uh, yes, more forums are always welcome. Uh, but let us uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that, uh, you know, uh, those forums have to be accessible, really, you know. There may be few lawyers, a few organizations, both within the domestic jurisdiction and, 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 and the jurisdiction where you want to go and, and, and sue them, say, Europe or at these new forums that will be created. But how many people really, how many people really will be able to access that? And that's really the, the crux of the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's turn to some of the challenges of transnational litigation. Um, I think Chima already mentioned a couple of times the concepts of home states and host states, where home states are the states where the corporation is incorporated, has its headquarters. Host state is where it has its operations, either through subsidiaries or in supply chains. And litigation can be done in either form, either in the host state or in the home state. Um, and of course, thinking about, well, where does it make sense? Where might judges be more willing to take on the corporation? Where might the legislation be more amenable to the claims that, uh, that you have? But you, Kranti, actually point even to another question, which is, well, logistically, how do you, how do you get that organized? Um, if you want to bring a claim, let's say, from Nigerian farmers, as you've done, to, to the Netherlands, how do you organize between organizations that then often are NGOs? Um, and there's the criticism, uh, I think it was from uh, Mr. Macau, that NGOs in the north um, tend to have a lot more access to certain institution, access to funding, um, and that there might be a power difference then in terms of deciding strategies between NGOs in the global north and NGOs in the global south. Um, but that even the NGOs in the global south at times tend to be elitist and quite removed from the constituencies that they pretend to act on their behalf. Um, so I'd like to, to discuss a little bit how, how you've, um, Chima, how you've dealt within your litigation, both with the, the logistics of it, how to organize it and how to strategize about it. And maybe you can also touch upon, which is um, another really difficult issue, that if you take your litigation from the host state to the home state, you actually have to argue that it's not just a subsidiary on the ground that had certain knowledge or um, did wrongful conduct. You also have to argue that the parent company knew about it, was involved with it. Um, it tends to be the challenge. And you've been able to at least get some stabs at that challenge. Please share with us. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. 
Um, for me, I've always said, you know, um, if you are facing a transnational company or corporation in any kind of engagement, first and foremost is that you must yourself try to be transnational too. I mean, it might sound somehow, um, how can you be transnational? We know that these companies, these transnational companies, the state authorities, you know, are intimidated by them. Because we have instances, you know, there are a lot of legislations that have not passed in Nigeria, not necessarily because we've not been able, those of us that have championed or continue to champion the cause of the promulgation of such laws, it's not that we've not been able to convince the legislators, you know, on the need for this type of laws. But because the multinationals whom these laws are going to regulate more heavily will intimidate the state authorities by saying simply, well, if you pass this, it means that we can do business, and if we don't do business, it means that you won't have money to run your government. And that alone works. So if you must match them, because how are they transnational? Because they have roots in different you know, countries, and then they operate in one country. So you, as a civil society actor, must try to identify like minds from different countries too, including the home countries of those corporations. That is the only time that you can make an impact. And when we started the four Nigerian farmers and fishermen against Shell case, we didn't just jump on, to, on it and started. It took us years. First and foremost was that um, there were two of us that discussed this first and agree that it's something that is to be pursued before we went, came back to now begin to convince our organizations you know, that there is the possibility of doing this. The first discussion that we had on this was between me and Anvan Shaik, who was here yesterday. And that was in 2005, even before 2005-2006, and we discussed that because then Anne van Schaik was a staff of Milo Defensive Friends of the Earth Netherlands, and I am um, a staff of Environmental Rights Action Friends of the Earth Nigeria. So both host and home country uh, actors coming together. And then we saw that it's something that we can do. And then we began to discuss with the leadership of our organizations. And that, you know, they saw reason with us and agreed that it was doable. And then we started the investigation. It wasn't easy. From the onset, we started with Professor Lisbeth as a Dutch lawyer working with me as a Nigerian lawyer. Because you must look at, you know, what type of evidence do you need to have? What type of law would you want to cite, would you want to use, okay? And when you do transnational litigation, it is a mixture of both home and host state laws. When it comes to the property laws, it is the home, the host, state law that is applicable. When it comes to you know, um, um, procedural law, it is that of the home state that applies. So you must see how you mix these two. Because otherwise, 
as a Nigerian lawyer that does not have the right of appearance in a Dutch court and may not equally follow, understand very critically the Dutch you know, procedural law, no matter how much I read it. You know, I cannot know it like a practicing lawyer from Netherlands. So this combination is what had helped us first to try to outsmart or cross over you know, those early um, issues that can discourage you. Because if a court decides that they don't have jurisdiction, I mean, your case, no matter how beautiful it is, you have to start all over again or go to another jurisdiction. Okay, so, but that combination helped us to know what to prove, what to present, and how to present it, and who to present it. Okay, so, this is where, you know, the transnationality of your campaign or the process you want to commence you know, becomes very necessary. And in that, we now expanded to have allies from different parts of the world. You know, supply amicus briefs, you know, help with some scientific researches, help with some, you know, legal researches too, and partnership with the media. Because I tell people, as a public interest lawyer, that look, you'd never lose any case. Never. It's simple, you can lose the, your case in the four walls of the courtroom, but you can win your case in the court of public opinion. That is how environmental rights action believes that litigation is the highest form of advocacy on any issue. Because this is where manipulation, you know, um, is a little bit lower if you know what you're doing, okay? If you are a creative lawyer and you are connected with the right um, allies, you don't need to go to bribe any judge, okay? Like the companies do. And, and I will tell you that in the, in the stop gas flare case, I was accused by the Shell lawyer, a senior advocate of Nigeria, equivalent of Queen's Council. You know, he said, Chima, you think we don't know what you people are doing? You know, you've, you've gone to bribe the judge. I told him, sir, you're a senior advocate. I'm just a young lawyer. Petition me to the uh, Legal Practitioners Disciplinary Committee. And then we will see between me and you who will cry. Now, because this is your stock in trade, so if you don't get your way, it means that every other person has applied that. So petition, and then I will tell you the, who went to the judge, the time the person went to the judge, how much the person offered the judge, simply because the judge refused your offer, you think that every other person does that. And that was the end of that discourse. Now, the point here is, you must know what you are doing. Be focused. Get connected with the right you know, allies, and you can make impacts. So now I will tell you, the stop gas flaring case that we did, because it just, um, maybe going back to yesterday, you do not, for, for me, I don't use the law just as an end itself, but as a means to an end. Because we know that judicial pronouncements are the highest level of the courts turns to become law at a point. And the stop gas flare case that we did, we used it to campaign for a change of the law itself. And we almost achieved that, but the corporations 
you know, because that's how the gas flaring prohibition and punishment bill came about in the Nigerian National Assembly. Okay, so even though we didn't achieve it because we knew of the externalities that came into play, you know, bribe scandal by Shell, fettering the legislators who were supposed to pass this bill out, give them a treat, and then they came back and said that we don't understand this bill. We don't understand it. And the Senate, the upper chambers, having passed that bill, waiting for the lower chambers to pass its own concurrent version, the lower chambers just refused. And that was the end of the story for that bill. So if we apply the law as a means to an end, we will see that we are doing some work. And at the end of the day, you know, we may gain some little, little changes that over time, if we work on them, can grow to bigger changes. Thank you. Um, I have one more question for Kranti, and then I'll open up the floor for questions. Kranti, India still has a huge agricultural sector. Um, and HRLN also works on the agro industry. Can you tell us about that? Uh, because it's, I mean, I think you can open up the floor, right, after this? Yeah, so I just think, I just wanted to say, I'm gonna try and give a little context to that question. Um, because we have a lot of people in the room um, and, and a lot of young people in the room. Uh, uh, and I think in the pre-lunch session, there was like a, really a call that went out from one of the speakers asking the young people to get more involved. Uh, while colonization has two, two parts to it, right? One is the distant past, right? You try to reach out into history and try and understand how history put certain systems into place and how those systems perpetuated a particular kind of economic order. The other form of colonization is the experience that we live every day. Uh, uh, you know, you, can, you just need to walk into one of the European markets or just walk down the street here. and. Uh, it's a privilege, really, to you know, to be able to go into that supermarket and get bananas outside. I, I, I don't think you can go bananas in this cold, but you get bananas here, and you get at a price uh, that is so highly subsidized. Yeah, uh, and that privilege of getting um, all of those strawberries and all of those berries sun-dried as part of your morning muesli. Uh, is an economic burden on large chunks of the world population. Right? A lot of the food that we get in our supermarket today uh, is an economic genocide for many, many parts of the world. And that is something that we need to be conscious about. And that is furthered in these developing econ economies through, uh, the, through these houses called agribusinesses. Right? Uh, in India, in the last two decades, we have had roughly 700,000 farmers who have chosen to kill themselves. Yeah? They go and hang themselves one evening because they cannot take it anymore. Um, and I'm not counting the number of starvation deaths that have happened because um, they just don't have enough food to eat. I'm just talking about people who decided that they couldn't take it anymore. They couldn't handle the mounting debt. They couldn't handle the fact that they couldn't get their children an education, they couldn't handle the fact that the bank or the private money lender was going to come and take their lands away. Because we've managed to put into place, at the instance of uh, business houses, many of them transnationals, about how we handle uh, intellectual property around seeds, how we handle access to water, because now water gets diverted from farmlands towards industry, how we handle protection mechanisms around land so that farmers would not in distress alienate their lands, um, how we handle protection in the law for indigenous communities, all of them have been watered down. All of them have been watered down. How do we handle pricing of uh, agricultural produce, which would ensure a minimum purchase price uh, for the farmer? Uh, how do we handle uh, the pricing of or the heavy dependence on, say, pesticides or fertilizers and the pricing of that? And the cumulative uh, expenditure that a farmer now undergoes back home just makes it impossible 
to make agriculture a viable enterprise for anybody other than the small scale farmer. The only person who really thinks it can be worthwhile is for the agribusiness. The laws have been so twisted. To ensure that the produce from there is available in evolved democracies or full democracies or whatever. Um, and that is the economic order we unfortunately, I'm sure the people in this room, I'm sure are really the converts, right? I, I don't know if there are very few people here who are curious to know what's happening and that's what they've walked in. Um, a lot of us are here because we believe that this has to change. Um, and, I'm, and a lot of you I know, who I know personally, make certain living choices about how you will not uh, further that exploitation. But that is the direct connect that, that's there, that's happening there, and that's present here, you know. And, and I think we need to really reflect on that. Um, we've gone to court many number of times, arguing for access to, say, water for farmers, um, asking for the protection of tenure of land for sharecroppers. Um, we've asked for price control, uh, for minimum support price. Um, we've asked for um, um, subsidized uh, access to uh, various social security schemes for farmers, uh, for farmers in distress during drought and famine. And there are various other cases that keep getting done. But the fact remains that a lot of your produce today out of the country is driven to go out of the country. And then there are schemes in place by the powers that be. I've said this year before last when I came to Berlin, but when I walked into one of the supermarkets here, what I was stunned, what I was stunned, I couldn't believe it, is that the, the bag of tea leaves uh, that, that, that I saw here was cheaper than the bag of tea dust back home. You know, I was talk we're talking about tea leaves here, cheaper than the bag of tea dust. It said, um, fair trade Darjeeling tea. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just get, I just get so angry about it because you take my word for it. I don't think there's a single fair trade tea garden in the entire country. Yeah, I, you have tea garden workers who have not been paid for months. We've had to go to court because we've had starvation deaths on those tea gardens. Uh, there is no way that there's a single tea garden in the country which can claim that there's fair trade. And all of the organizations here that certify that that tea is fair trade is pure humbug. Yeah, it's not possible. The people out there who have not been paid for months, the people out there who have not been able to feed their children, and they're all dead. And through a complex process of shareholding, uh, which a lot of the control rests here, in the auction houses, the prices are driven down. Uh, that's with most cash crops and most cash products. Uh, and, and so that's the phase of you know, agribusiness that's happening. And it's only growing. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to make that connection. You know, I just thought that we really need to take that leap from you know, the, a large chunk of the discourse has been about the past. And I think there's a certain degree of colonization that continues today. And that needs to be really tied up to what's happening. And then and there's a lot of litigation happening inside the country, but I, against, uh, we've not taken a lot of litigation against, we've sued the tea garden owners, uh, some of them are transnationals, but we, but I, I, I see a certain degree of litigation that will happen now in the future. Inside domestic jurisprudence, it'll be very, very interesting to see how you could bring those cases uh, here um, to both the consumer and, and the mechanism that brings it to the consumer here. You know, I, I think that's important. Uh, thank you, Quentin. Uh, I shouldn't have got angry. You're actually bringing up um, the kinds of actors that now enable perpetuation of the situation as it is in supply chains, in the factories, in the mines, um, in, in your countries. Um, when I was on the train a couple of weeks ago, I met a woman and she actually um, co controlled the certification of a fair trade label here in Germany. And she had visited Kenya and she had told that the fair trade label needed to be taken away because the conditions were not good enough. Even before she got back to Germany, the very large company 
um, had called her label and had said, uh, you know, if you, if you don't give us the certification back right now, we withdraw our, all our uh, commissioned audits to you. And the small fair trade label gave in because they were going to lose jobs if they wouldn't do it. Um, so it really shows how the companies are able to use their power. Um, ECCH Arts actually has started to um, try to hold these certifiers uh, accountable um, for the role that they play in the perpetuation of these, these structures. So the floor is opened. Who would like to ask a question? I'm going to take three questions and then we'll have answers. One over here, one over there, a third one. Please start. Uh, I have a question to Kranti. Um, Can you please introduce yourself before? Oh, you speak? my name is Tatjana Scheltma. I'm a journalist from uh, the Netherlands. Um, how are you? Is is there a way to to battle this uh, inequality through law, or should it happen by politics? And how would you go about that? Thank you. Second question was over there. Can you raise your hand again? Um, yep. You'll get a microphone. Sorry, I, my English is not so very good. Uh, Sie können auch auf Deutsch sprechen. I think, bitte? Sie können auch auf Deutsch sprechen, wenn Sie wollen. Dann um, maybe, maybe I will. Go I, will ahead. I will tell you about an example that the European law is protecting German uh, living animals. They were uh, transporting to five kilometers. Uh, 5,000 kilometers to other, other countries. And it's not so important to protect people in other countries. In, uh, there was a court case in Germany, one, uh, one, uh, Gericht? one, one court uh, stopped transport uh, living animals to five kilometers far away because in the European Union is a law they have a special law to protect, to give them water every time, every day. And uh, so this court stopped the transport. They didn't allow the company to transport the animals outside of, in this case, of Germany or the European. And uh, I, in my thinking, it is maybe possible to use this uh, possibility to stop uh, some dealing with other countries in the case to say, okay, we have here in the European Union the law, maybe you don't have to burn the gas and you are not allowed to burn the gas in Nigeria too and to stop this kind of business. It's a little bit pop point of imperialism or colonialism to, to, to put our law from here to another country, it's in the in a one way it's bad, in one way maybe it's also good to deal with this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a third question there at the back. Claire. Hello, hello. Are you um, gonna speak in French? My question. okay. Oh, sorry, no go yeah, no. Uh, should I try English? Yes. Please try English. I, I don't uh, speak French. Uh, yes. I, my question is exactly completing what the gentleman said uh, toward Mr. Chima. Um, I'm a little bit confused about your effort to do petition and get shell in Holland, in The Hague. Because I read what you wrote in 2013 which The Guardian has already published. And you wrote that we considered all the opin option and the history of litigation in Nigeria before deciding to take the case to Holland, said William. We could not have confidence in the judiciary in Nigeria because coming from our experience, when the, the judiciary gives a judgment, the enforcement of that judgment by the executive becomes a problem, which means the problem is in Nigeria. 
And Shell is a multinational business company. Nigeria is a democratic country. As we all know, Africans, there is no powerful country in Africa than today. Why should the activist take out Nigeria to judge a company? Why cannot be done in Nigeria? Because the interest is for the whole country. I just see it to my understanding as a way we always try to say that neo-colonialism, they are colonizing us, colonizing us. Share is not a country, it's a company. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so Kranti, you will first have the floor to answer. Uh, you know, sometimes you get carried away when you come to a totally new environment, you completely forget what you were supposed to do which was to talk about, for me, was to talk about some of the cases that we've done back home and some of the cases that we're trying to take up here. Um, then, you know, there's only so much of self-love you can. <laughs> And um, uh, and the government appealed, and that case is still uh, running. But it seems very hard to to uh, push the um, uitvoerende macht, uh, executive powers. the executive powers, to um, actually uh, live by the law. So there, there's this sort of egg and chicken yeah. problem. I, just just going back to your question. So what I wanted to emphasize was that. There has been a good run as far as rights of persons are concerned within the domestic courts. I believe there is great potential to look outside your jurisdiction, outside our jurisdiction and explore that. But like I was saying earlier, it's not really an or. You, know, you, you, you use the law, you use the courtroom as much as possible and you agitate and you have, you've had various calls to the conscience of the country, to its leaders from the courts, saying on various aspects you know, that you cannot, from, from things like, uh, honestly, I think if you take the Supreme Court of India or its constitutional courts and you put their calls to, the, to, to one's conscience, really, under what we call as a right to life and how we've expanded that con construct to mean so many different rights, uh, so many different rights. It's a fantastic read. Um, uh, it's been a struggle and a battle to affect those judgments and that's the everyday struggle. And that is where I think you have a direct correlation to having a very, very uh, active population that is conscious of its rights and asserts it. And I think it's, it's, the, it's this apolitical population that happens both on both sides of the border, really, here as well as there, where, when people let their government's unbridled power, uh, and, and don't question it regularly, and often enough, is where both governments then act contrary to their people's interest. Uh, and, and, and I think the answer to your question is that, is it really the law or the politics? I think both. Uh, you just, yeah, they go hand in hand. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you very much for um, the question you asked. Uh, first and foremost is that there is no confusion about what we are doing and my statement has remained the same from beginning till tomorrow. I, I have never doubted the competence of the judicial system in Nigeria. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten the judgment. As a lawyer, I have not lost any single case in the Nigerian courts. Okay, so the statement you read you equally pointed out that I said because of no lack of enforcement by the executive, it's not that the courts, you know, will not give me uh, judgment if I deserve it and if I have proved my case. So now on the other side, Shell is not a sovereignty, and that is the discon the the this construct that I, we want to show that 
Shell is a company, it's not a sovereignty. And in taking Shell to court in Netherlands for her misdeeds in Nigeria, we are not questioning the sovereignty of Nigeria as a state because we did not sue Nigeria in, in the Netherlands or in The Hague, okay? Shell, as it is, is a personality in Holland as well as a personality in Nigeria. So if it wants to hide under the fact that it is a foreign company and then commit atrocities in Nigeria, it is the duty of all of us to say you cannot run away from your misdeeds simply because you tell us that you are a non-Nigerian company. So if a Nigerian citizen commits a crime in Holland, will that person be arrested by the Dutch police, uh, police or not? The answer is that the person will be arrested and tried. So it is the same thing that we want to do. If you commit a crime in Nigeria, and we think that our problem is not that we cannot get the courts to make a pronouncement against you, but when we get that pronouncement against you, you are stronger and bigger than those that will compel you to abide by that decision, then it is only fair that we will match you you know, where you may not have such opportunity of escape. So in that, there is no controversy because the only controversy that, you know, the only problem that we envisaged and which we had solved and given the world, you know, at least in Europe, a new vista of legal prism that they can look up to, you know, in terms of bringing cases from host countries to home countries is the jurisdictional question, which have been resolved you know, in our favor at the Court of Appeal in The Hague. So with that, it means that my brother, Kranti, from India can bring a German company that has violated Indian rights in India you know, through her subsidiaries you know, to court in Germany. Thank you. Can I just, um, yeah, can I just say just one thing quickly? Uh, so practicing law in India is really very different from in, in many other jurisdictions for two reasons. Is that within our constitution, within the scheme we understand, we see, this, we see our courts as an integral part of the definition of the state and it is the mandate, and we see it as the mandate of our courts to implement the constitution and the laws under it, which is one. That, that's very, for us, that's very clear. So the courts are accountable to the people to ensure that the law is furthered. The other curious aspect about the Indian judicial system is that our courts also have the power to make the law. So if there's been inaction on part of the legislature or the executive in making the law on a particular subject, the courts not only can step in and say if they, don't, if they disagree that the law that the state has crafted, let's say the executive or the legislature has crafted, and they find that the law is problematic, they can completely expunge it, one. Two is if they find that the government has failed in bringing about a law on a particular topic. Let's say on sexual harassment, we didn't have a law. We did not have a, a prescription in our statute books that provided women the protection that they should have at a workplace. Our con constitution court stepped in and made the law. And then that law governed the field for approximately two decades before the legislature stepped in with something on a similar footing. So it's been a very, uh, it's, it's a very different exercise back home, really, about. Uh, it's, it's been a very creative space. Uh, hopefully, transnationals will also feel it's. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to take um, the third remark that we got um, as the starting point for my closing words of this session. Um, because what you propose um, is the kind of sort of innovative thinking um, that then sort of itself brings up a lot of questions that you don't know what to, how to deal with it. Is it suddenly then colonial to impose such a kind of law on another situation? 
Um, and I think that's the kind of questions, um, Chima and Kranz, that you also deal with sort of on a daily basis as you try to see how you can take a system that is biased in its foundation, um, but you have decided to still use it and to say we can use it and, and we believe that by using it we can actually make changes. Um, law has always been slow, so um, as the world is developing and you have creatures like transnational corporations, um, the law is behind in dealing with them. And the litigation that you have initiated um, and have brought to courts and where courts have given their pronouncements are all bits and pieces that start to push the law um, in a different direction from where it came from. Um, I'd like first to thank the interpreters um, for having done such a good job in interpreting these all sessions. And then I'd like to thank the both of you for sharing so richly from your experiences from Nigeria and India. And now there will be a very brief uh, closure from Wolfgang Kalik. We can stay seated. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's time. It's, it's time to leave. So some very quick remarks. A big thanks to not only the last panel, but to all speakers. A big thanks to all of you who participated until the very end of this uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, a big thanks to the hosts, the Akademie der Künste, especially Judith and Johannes, but also the whole team, the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung. Uh, also my colleague Karina, who did a wonderful job to bring this all together. Please don't forget, when you slowly walk out, there are two installations, one on the ground floor, one really down in the basement, both worth to be seen. And there is also this little bookstore, see and when you walk out on left hand, maybe you can have even a look and a chat there. Um, talking about, it's, it's, it makes no sense to summarize the conference, but let's talk about the two goals we had in mind um, from, I think the first one we, we and others achieved um, recently here in Germany, and that is breaking the silence of the graveyard. I mean, um, like uh, Christian Bomarius said uh, uh, a while ago, uh, a couple of years ago, um, this kind of discussion didn't take place in Germany. Now, at least they take place. Um, we heard a lot about the dark sides, the dark history, the imperialist history of international law. Um, and uh, I won't forget uh, Macau's test for all our seriousness, and that is, um, are we really willing to challenge the right to property? If we are not, forget all about what we have been talking about. Um, but still, both of them, and uh, I hope you're still somehow convinced, Makau and Tony, um, I would like to continue that discussion with you, because you still saw potential of law. Obviously, we, we need a new economic world order. That's politics, like Makau put it out. Um, but that's also creating new laws. Caroline pointed to it in, in the last session. And as we heard today a lot, it's exhausting existing law. And uh, how creative um, people can be, you heard over the last hours. Um, but who are the actors? who help to decolonize law and, and make it useful for global justice. I can tell you who are not the actors. It's not the governments. We heard not of one single government, maybe in the Nauru case you didn't uh, finish, but um, it's not the German government, definitely not the German government. The German government, uh, as well as the Dutch government, like uh, thinking of themselves, of the champions of human rights and whatever, is really setting a very, very bad example. And we have to talk about that much more than only on this conference. It's unfortunately also not the African governments we talked about. It's not Namibia, it's not Cameroon, it's also not India, it's also not Nigeria. So who are the actors? 
it's, it's not very forceful, but still a nice coalition. Um, some of the actors um, we gathered here, it's, it's new coalitions and new networks between North and South. It's the communities. It's the communities of um, not the Namibian state, but the Herero and Nama community brought the case to New York. It was not the Indonesian state who cared for the reparation for, for, for the Indonesian victims of, of the massacres of the Dutch. It was the Nine Widows, the first clients of Lisbeth. It are the social movements you uh, are, are working with. It's some NGOs with all the questions we have about NGOs. And it's activists, local activists like, like, like you, like post-colonial um, in, 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 in Berlin, who put this agenda on the table. And who try to make law a mobilizing, fact, mobilizing factor, um, like, like Esther well expressed. So the, for me, um, the second goal, obviously a conference is, has, with all its restrictions, cannot achieve that much. But um, for me, the question is, can we move one step ahead? And one step ahead would mean to organize forceful solidarity for all the people and all um, the movements, uh, all the sufferings um, we heard about the last two days. And I really would like to point out the issue of Herero, and that is something for us in Germany where we have to do much more um, in, that, um, uh, in that window of opportunity which was opened by, by the lawsuit in New York. Um, I was asked, are you happy with this conference? How can you, happy we, um, with, do, how can you be happy with the conference having talking about massacres, um, violations, rape? and moreover about the ignorance of our governments and other actors towards this injustice. No, I'm not happier, I'm angrier. I'm much angrier than I was yesterday morning when I entered this building, and I hope you join me in this anger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you, Franti. <laughs> so let's rush on. <laughs>